Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you guys all coming up here um, and listening to me talk. Um, I've, uh, I give this talk, or versions of it, um, in other places, and I usually talk to other veterinarians and other ophthalmologists and other surgeons, so it's good to come back and talk at these conferences. I remember coming to these things a long time ago, and um, it, they changed my life. So I'm glad you're all here. It's, it's great to, to be with you. So thank you for sharing this with me. So have you, any of you been to Toronto? You, you really should go. I mean, get up, go now. It's a beautiful place. That's where I work. It's not where I'm from, but it's where I work. It's a beautiful city. I just wanted to throw that out there. It doesn't always look like this. You have to be out in the water. So you're either in a boat or you're swimming. Um, but it's a beautiful place, so come visit. So the itinerary, I love that there's dogs in here too. I, I want to go do exams on them, maybe <laughs> afterwards. So um, first, there's, there's no way to cover all of this. I tried. I rewrote this talk a few times. In fact, I kind of rewrote it today. So I might have to look at my slides a few times because last second, as I always am, I rewrote it to a large extent. But there's no way to cover everything. I'm going to try to hit the high notes on here. There's going to be some nonsense about me. I just could better bring that up as an example of what are options that you can do. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about veterinary medicine and training, although some of it's going to be largely different over here in Europe. And I'm going to talk about some ways that I've found to be an advocate, animal advocate as a veterinarian. And then I'm going to try to get all of you to become veterinarians, every single one of you, by the end of the day. So briefly, um, and so the schooling system in the U.S. works a little bit different than here. Is anyone here from the States, Canada? <laughs> one, two, there we go. That's good. I was just in Mexico. So it was... Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So the schooling there is going to be different, and some of these comments, they don't apply. Um, but I went to college. So in the US, we call it college when you go after high school. No one else seems to use it that way. Um, but I went there for four years, and then did some other stuff in human optometry, and then evolutionary biology of visual systems and different animals. Then I went to grad school in biotechnology at Johns Hopkins in Maryland. And then did vet training, went to University of Wisconsin, and that's four years. And then two internships, so that's two more. And then three year residency. So veterinary training is nine years if you want to specialize. But it's going to be different here. I think it's six years for vet school, but you go right after high school. And then you can specialize after that as well. Are there any veterinarians here? You got one. Are there any people considering going to veterinary school? Are there pe any people open to considering veterinary school? Okay, because I'm going to do my best to try to open this up as a possible avenue. So I became vegan around 20 years ago, and I don't really have a good story about it. This girl I was dating asked me to do it, and I said, yeah. I mean, I liked her. I wanted her to stick around. She didn't, but, I, was, but I, I stayed vegan, and it's become a big part of my life. Um, so but for the first 10 years, um, I, ex I largely expressed my veganism through standard of holding up you know, signs and going to demonstrations and putting on film screenings and handing out flyers, like every day I'd hand out flyers outside of school. Um, and then I was in graduate school, one of them, and it kind of decided on a whim I don't really recommend making big life decisions this way. I'm gonna to go to vet school. And then I applied to every single place I could in the States and somehow one of them let me in. Um, so now I've been an adv animal advocate as both a non-veterinarian and a veterinarian and I have some kind of perspectives on the different ways that being a veterinarian can help. So I work full time now as a as an eye surgeon, so I do like cataract surgery for dogs and cats. I never saw that coming as a kid. I didn't think that's, I'd be doing eye surgery on rabbits, but <laughs> life has surprises for you. 
Um, but I try to travel as much as I can now to animal rescues and sanctuaries around the world. And I, I do document them. I'm very new to this social media thing, but you can see the, the, the trips that I go on. Um, I'm a vegan veterinarian. So this is the veterinary oath that we say in the US and Canada. I'm sure there's equivalents that you are said over here. I solemnly swear, dot, dot, dot. There's some other meaningless, less meaningful stuff in there. To adhere to a code of conduct that ensures the relief of animal suffering. Now, it doesn't say what animals. It doesn't say dogs and cats. That would, that would clarify a lot of things, wouldn't it? It keeps it pretty open, all animals, correct? Not, and I have to say that not too many veterinarians actually adhere to this component, unfortunately. So, should any of you go to vet school? Short answer, yes. So you all have an affinity and an empathy for animals, I assume, unless you're here just for interest. So that's a good start. It's a huge time, personal life, and financial investment. It's hard. It's not, it's not an easy path to pursue. But it's worth it. An interest in the sciences helps, but you don't have to. A lot of veterinarians, a lot of really good veterinarians, did not study the sciences before going to vet school. They did other things. And they bring unique traits to being a veterinarian. And don't think you're too old. Okay, this is important. This is important to me. Don't think you're too old or you missed your chance. Okay, like I didn't go to vet school until I was 30. Like I did these other things. I basically, I lived in a car for a while and before this. And um, there was a, you might know this hurricane in the US called Hurricane Katrina. It's a big deal there. I don't know if it makes the news here. But I went there, did animal rescue, saw the veterinarians helping these animals and it really made a big difference to me. And it influenced what I wanted to do. But I was like, geez, I kind of missed my chance. No, vet schools like older students. They really do. They're very dedicated, they're very motivated, and you can go later in life, and they, I actually think you have a better chance of getting in um, when you're as an older student. And if you like to be in your pajamas all day like I do, I didn't really know how much I liked it, but it makes packing really easily. I, I just, I can go on trips around the world and just in a backpack, I got three pairs of scrubs, I'm good. I don't have to look good because I look like I'm doing something, even when I'm not. So this, this field really helps you help animals in a lot of ways. So we need more veterinarians in the animal rights movement. This is, this is really important. There's only a very small number of veterinarians who are vegan. I was the only one in my class. And I think that was a shame. There really should have been more. It's becoming more common though, and in the, I'm near the Ontario Veterinary School, which is near Toronto, and it's a, a big school, and they had 10 vegan vets, students, in their first year class. And I work with them, and it's so encouraging, it's wonderful to see, and it's becoming more and more common. But as of right now, there's very little. There are veterinary vegan groups out there too, and we talk to each other about issues. So veterinarians are important here because they're highly trusted by the public. One of the most trusted fields, veterinarians and nurses in the US are the most trusted you know, fields out there. The public actually looks up to us. So this provides us an opportunity to talk about these animal issues. And for many kids, like what do kids want to do when they grow up, right? They want to they be veterinarians, astronauts, firemen, dinosaurs, right? <laughs> Two of those are pretty hard to do, you know. So, I mean, they want to be veterinarians. They love animals, right? That's, what, that's a big thing. Kids love animals, and they emulate it. And you ask a kid who loves animals, what do they do? I want to be a vet. Most veterinarians wanted to be, you know, be, be a vet because they had an affinity for animals. So it's the same thing. And so you can act. They won't want to emulate you. So veterinarians can be a highly meaningful force in making change. But there's a big reason why a lot of people who are animal advocates don't want to go to vet school, right? And I hear these all the time. I get written almost every day by people considering going to veterinary school, want to go, but they don't want to because of these certain factors. 
Right? They, they love animals too much to see them in pain. They don't want to ever euthanize an animal. You know, I don't want to ever do a palpation, you know, where you, that gross thing, right? Um, I don't want to ever do a terminal surgery, which is a euthanasia. Um, and I can never go work on a production facility like a, a farm, right? And that's, a, that's probably the most common one I hear. Like even for like a week, when that's part of a lot of uh, curriculums. But most of these can be addressed. So 99% of vet school is sitting in class, sitting in the room, taking notes. Like you don't have these ethical challenges on, uh, on most of it. You're just, t you're just in school. So it's, uh, it's something that can be surpassed. Animals are in pain whether you see it or not, so it, don't be afraid to see it. You're there to help them. Okay. And so it's a great way to actually alleviate pain and suffering. Terminal surgeries, like when animals are killed at the end of surgery, is no longer done in most, in most veterinary schools. I can't really speak to all the ones outside of the U.S. and Canada, but it's not happening in the U.S. Um, and many times our alternatives can be found. And, and uh, you know, I made a connection yesterday, and so there are alternatives to look. If you have an ethical dilemma, you can talk to your um, professors and your instructors and try to come up with alternative ways of demonstrating knowledge of the information that is consistent with your ethics. So don't give up just because there are these seeming um, obstacles. And once you're in a vet school, you can make a lot of changes from within. I, I was talking to my friend Sarah Dodd, and you guys all should know her too. She's a great veterinarian and animal nutrition resident. I'll talk more about her later. Um, but she was telling me a story about how, how they usually, in her school, they would euthanize chickens, and she made it so they're no longer euthanized. They find homes for them. And that's the type of stuff you can do. So getting into vet school, I'll make this really brief because it's going to be different here. Can, this is mostly on the, over on state side. Um, you got to have a good GPA. These, do these numbers mean anything to you? GRE, GPA? Okay. You got to do well. It's about a 10%, 10 to 15% um, admission, but if you're within a, a certain state, it's easier. Don't, don't get turned off by those numbers. It might be totally different in your, in your countries. Um, so these, these prerequisites are the, the ones that will hold over. You've got to do well in school, and you've got to get some recommendation letters, and you have to shadow. You've got to shadow a lot of veterinarians. Come shadow me. I have students every week almost. These are requirements. I hope that makes sense. There's a test at the end of this. And now you can specialize too, and this is a unique way to help animals as well. I really wanted to work with wildlife, but getting into the wildlife side of veterinary medicine is extremely challenging. A little bit less challenging is a, a other specializations like ophthalmology, which I italicized because it is the best subject, just so you all know. There, with these specializations, yes, you focus on one thing, but you can help a lot of animals in a lot of different ways. So I just do eyes. But you know who has eyes? You have eyes? I can't practice on you. But I can practice on every other animal that has eyes. Everything. Not just dogs and cats. Everything. So the, there's a huge variability. I go to farm sanctuaries. I do surgeries there. You know, I go see wildlife. I help them. Because they all have eye problems. It's a very big, com it's, a, it's a common th reason for animals to seek veterinary care. But it, that holds true for a lot of the other specializations. And you can see there's like animal welfare. That's one. Nutrition, it's another important one. And then there's other ones like the, that you might not want to think about going into, like poultry, right, or lab animal, or, or therio. Like, but this is areas where we actually need advocates within these fields. Right, and so that's the point of this slide. We need people to not avoid the troublesome things, that, like veterinary medicine, if they have conflicts with it, or the specializations that scream ethical dilemmas. These are places exactly where we should go. Right? And maybe if I could do it again, I might go into like a large animal medicine instead of trying to avoid it like I did as a vet student. I wish I really focused on it and went into it. I might be able to make even bigger changes than I am now. So these are different things that you can do as a vet that might help you help animals. We all want to help animals, right? So this is some things coming up. These are just examples, right? This is, this is educating the public about things. This is a rabbit conference. I got to write a, con like a talk on this, and I have two weeks to do it. 
if you guys want to put bets on it, whether I can do it or not. Right? So talk about rabbit eye disease. Right? And up there, the top right, I was in Mexico giving a talk on um, doing spay neuters and doing eye exams. So you can go, you can travel everywhere, and they're so appreciative when you go there. And this is a, a veterinary com, um, community that I'm, these are all veterinarians that I'm talking to about doing eye, eye exams. So you can, if you can learn a trade, you can go spread this to other places around the world and, and it help them help animals. Uh, this one doesn't really show up too well. This cat, um, there's really interesting things going on with its eyes and the owners were concerned. It turned out it was just a developmental interesting thing um, called the persistent pupillary membrane where the, the blood vessels covered our pupils. I don't wanna get too sciencey and it's hard for me not to geek out here guys, but when we're, when we're developing we have this membrane over our pupils that goes away as we are um, at the very end of our development. And if it persists, there can have membranes over our pupils. It happens in people sometimes too, or little fibers. And that's what this cat had. It's something called a persistent pupillary membrane, a particularly cool version. So you can volunteer and help your local dog and cat rescues. I know a lot of us talk a lot about farm animal issues, but right, all animals matter. And so dog and cat rescues need our help too. They really need our help. So this is a blind dog named Stevie. He's the best dog ever. Um, I had a, he had a, a difficult story and I had to remove both of his eyes and he was blind since birth so he didn't miss him, but it helped him. It's a cat with, I tried to put the rescues. I work with all tons of rescues. So that's a cat who had its eyelids rolling in. Right? So, and he had ulcers and he, he lived his entire life with his eyelids rolling in and the fur rubbing on his corneas and he was found off the streets and he was just miserable. He could barely open his eyes and every time he did, it was excruciating pain. Yeah, fixed, right? You can fix these things. There's a dog, his name Baloo. You're blind, it comes from an island. Happy dog, the sanctuary just wanted to make sure he's okay. So yeah, he's blind, but he's okay. So you can help these rescues a lot. And this is, this is one I just recently did. This is a North Toronto cat rescue. Um, I just called them up, asked if they need any help. So this cat has a, a deep corneal ulcer. It's anesthetized here, that's why it's lying down. And then this is a, a sorry, it's a little graphic maybe. It's a corneal conjunctival graft over the, over the cornea. He's giving me a scowl here, but that's how he looks a few weeks later doing better, right? So you can help as a veterinarian, you can donate your time to rescues and shelters and provide them with care that they don't get. Most vets do not donate their time and efforts, surgeries, examinations, they might get a 10% discount, but these rescues need help. They're doing their part and veterinarians can do their part as well. This is a great sanctuary called the Blind Cat Rescue Sanctuary. It's in North Carolina. Almost all their cats are blind, um, but you wouldn't know it. They're playing. They're wonderful. So you can help these re rescues, and they, they need it. You all should visit there. I even said y'all like I was from North Carolina. So this is the equivalent. This is actually one of the most important points that I try to get across. Okay. As a veterinarian, I chose long ago not to make money, <laughs> right? We don't go into veterinary medicine to, to be rich. You would have gone into human medicine, um, but most veterinarians decided against that. They liked animals. That's why they're in it. So I, don't, I can't donate endless amounts of money to these places, even though I try. But you can make up for that in amazing ways, right? You can, you can donate your time that's equivalent to more money than you could ever donate. So. This is a conservative estimate, 12 surgeries a year, right? And I, I probably at least do double that, right? So there's, most surgeries are gonna be three to $6,000, okay? So very conservative numbers. And you do one surgery a month, do 10 exams a month, right? You save these places at least $60,000 a year, right? And so you can never donate that. But these animals need that help, and they might get euthanized if they don't, or they're gonna be suffering if they don't. Right? So you, this is a great way to help. And I do this almost every single weekend. So you're helping wildlife. Right? Wildlife's really important too. These guys have no advocates, very little. But you can help them. This is a, I just put up some recent examples. This is a fawn. 
at a rescue called Procyon Wildlife. And you guys know fawns are baby deer, so your, your English is all really good. I'm so impressed, like with everyone I've talked to. But so this fawn had this conjunctivitis, which is inflammation around the conjunctiva. A lot of discharge, right? So the, they called me, had me come take a look. I'm like, sure, I'll go play with baby deer if you have to twist my arm, right? And it just took a little bit of medications. And here he is, much better. And you get fawn kisses, which is a great payment method. But there's lots of, I could put up slides upon slides. All right, you guys know what this is? Porcupine? What is that in French? Porcupine? I've never gotten that. And then German? Okay, <laughs> I like that one. So it, it's had, you know, it had um, eye issues there, and the top corner is a, a reindeer, right, and a chameleon, right? So, you, like, that's endless. All these places need your help as a vet. If you want to work with wildlife, just call them. They'll be like, get over here in a second. We need you. And you're not just a visitor. You're actually truly helping them. So conservation issues are really important, too. You can help on this. It's a weird-looking dog, isn't it? So this is a green sea turtle. This is what they're supposed to look like. Okay, so when I used to live in Florida, I found out that they don't always look like this. They have, there's a scourge of a virus-induced tumors that grow around their eyes and around their axilla and around their shell, and they can even be inside their bodies. And it really inhibits the way that they can swim. And it's a virus that's probably been there for a long time, but no doubt anthropogenic factors are influencing this, and it's, there's been an uptick in these. And some of these sea turtles are endangered, like critically endangered. So they don't need any of these problems. So here's one that looks like, this is, this is what these tumors look like. You don't see these, but this is really common. Right? If you go down to, to Florida or Hawaii you'll, and, you, and you try to go help out these turtle rescues, like they're getting these turtles with this problem commonly. And they get stranded because they can't swim. They can't find food many times. So we, um, so when I was down there, I would, I, would, I would cut these off and release them back in the wild after some rehabilitation. So you can help wildlife as well. And if conservation is meaningful to you. So farm sanctuaries. Do you have a lot of farm sanctuaries in Europe? I mean, there's the, the kind of the more famous ones. Spain has quite a few famous ones. Denmark does as well. Um, Germany has one up near Munich, but I don't know there's too many around elsewhere. I don't know if Luxembourg has any. Um, but there's, they're, very, they're becoming extremely common in the US and Canada. They're popping up very rapidly. The first one, Farm Sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York, was inspirational to me. But then several others have popped up since. And visiting one in Maryland, outside the girl I mentioned, was a big deal on why I went on one vegan spending the time with these traditionally farmed animals um, is so meaningful. And so, yeah, these sanctuaries stand at a contrast to how these animals are traditionally treated. And so it's wonderful that these are sprouting up. So I go to these sanctuaries a lot. Now, I'm medically limited to a large extent and to practice within my province. I can't just go anywhere in the US and Canada and practice surgery. There's laws against that, but you know, I can give them some advice. But anything in Ontario, which is, a, again, a big province of Canada, goes, I can do that. And then in other countries, I can go down to Mexico and do surgeries or elsewhere. But I, I'll go to these sanctuaries and do exams and surgeries if I can. And they all know to contact me. They, they ask me if I can do anything to, to help them on their cases. This is just a small example of some. These are all over. So Farm Animal Refuge is a great sanctuary in Southern California. Enchanted Farm Sanctuary is in Oregon. Odd Man Inn is in Washington State. So is Wildwood. Just a small section. These are sanctuaries that I go to and um, try to help them with any medical problems. So this is things that you could do as a vet. You can help these sanctuaries who don't have money. Right? They rely exclusively on donations. 
and you're helping these traditional farmed animals. Here's an example. This is a, a, a goat, sheep named Haley. Sorry, misspoke. So, so Haley, you guys need to know Haley at Black Goat Sanctuary. Look her up. She's a great story. She kind of looks like an insect at this point. She's got some growth abnormalities, but she's a lovely animal. And she had an ulcer. This is when she was really young. And so she had an ulcer. So they called me over and I found it. This is a test called the fluorescein dye test. The stain will stick up, stick to areas where there's an ulcer. Right? So there was an ulcer and we got you on medic medications and she's doing well. You guys like chickens? <laughs> Try to do chicken eye exams here. It's hard. They move their head constantly. They don't listen to reason. <laughs> and this is really magnified, so my field of view is very small, so I get... <laughs> I try not to. I try not to sit it on the farm, but I can if I have to. Yeah. Yeah, their little faces are all over. But doesn't it look fun? Okay, that's my point. I'm trying to get across. These are the good challenges. How do I do an eye exam on a chicken? <laughs> Um, this is a, uh, a bovine who had squamous cell carcinoma around the eye. Very common disease, high sun light, and it causes damage to their, usually their lower eyelid, their third, third, third eyelid. This is a, a farm sanctuary. They have no money. They can't take these animals to get vet care. Or if they do, it causes a huge amount of their budget. So a top picture is, there I'm doing surgery in my Sea Shepherd sweatshirt, right? And there's Sarah Dodd, my, my colleague and good friend, also another vegan veterinarian. And there, you know, we just removed the tumor. All right, so this is Luna. Luna is a, a Holstein cow. She lived um, for many years in a production facility, forced, you know, forcibly impregnated to have um, babies that were taken away for her. That's a, so she could keep making milk, right? Terrible stories. And she had this very bad eye condition that her eyes were bulgy and they were turned inward. I won't belabor you with the name of it, but they were painful. Their eyes were blind and painful for years and years. And so the sanctuary had the, you know, they reached out to me and asked if I could do anything. I, um, I said, yeah, I would be happy to. I don't like to do surgery out in the field of this nature, so go to the local vet school. She asked the local vet school, and they said no, right, for not good reasons in my mind. And so we did the surgery out in the, out in the barn and removed, removed these painful eyes, and now she's out enjoying life. She's no longer in pain. But, and she couldn't see anyway. She, just, she doesn't mind that her eyes are gone. And, the, and so... She's living a great life, and, and you can look, learn about her story. She's had um, uh, quite the transition, and you should go visit her. Well, you like ducks? You can. This is a duck rescue. You can go out there and help. This so basically, I'm trying to say that there's lots of different things that you can do as a veterinarian. It's endless, absolutely endless. That was a loud place to be, but I am so happy I was there. I like held half of those ducks. Um, and then when as I travel too, you can document, wow, that's rapid. Um, <laughs> so, um, you can, so you can document a lot of things that happen at these sanctuaries too. This, this, is a, this is a story, I couldn't quite edit this down to my chagrin. This is another rescue called Arthur's Acres in New York.
right? So these are the sanctuaries that when I go there and do their vet care if I can, and I like to tell the stories as well. So getting the word out, so being a veterinarian opens the doors to visiting a lot of these sanctuaries. Okay, they're, you don't have to go on visit days. And you just call them up and say, can I come? And they're like, yes. And you can tell the stories. Do you guys like to travel? Everyone likes to travel these days. I grew up in a family where travel wasn't a thing, and I tried it out, and I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't have to sit in this room my whole life. I can actually, there's more to things. So being a veterinarian really helps traveling. Okay, this is a, um, a fun thing to know. So contact any rescue you want to go, any place in the world you want to go. Say, hey, can I come help your animals? Now, you can do that even as a non-veterinarian. But as a veterinarian, it really helps. And they almost always say yes, and they'll let you sleep on a couch, which I'm happy. I'd be happy sleeping on a bag of, you know, rusty nails, you know. But it really helps. And then, so it facilitates traveling. And I really like that part of it. But you have to check. Some places, there's legal issues. But for an example, I was able to go on to Mexico recently and, and do lots of surgeries and like they even put me up in a five-star hotel. I don't know. I don't need that. But sometimes that happens. So there are drawbacks. This is important to, to mention. Um, it's the, the application is competitive. The debt is big, particularly in the U.S. I, don't, I can't even bring it up because I'll be reduced to tears in front of you. But it's not like that in many other places. In Canada, where I work, it's much easier for them, much less expensive. And I believe it's the same over in Europe. Um, but talking about cost of care can be challenging. There's high expectations from the public. Um, you can't know everything. There's legal issues more and more. You get sued more. I fortunately haven't experienced that, but it does happen. Um, there's a lot of pressure that we put in. And the one thing that you guys should know, it does have the highest suicide rate of any, of any field. Okay, that's kind of a downer, right? I, I'm not supposed to end these things on downers. But this is, it is an important issue, right? So I've lost friends, I've lost colleagues to this, okay? So there's a recent study in the, in the US side that female veterinarians are three and a half times more likely than general population and vet, male veterinarians 2.1 times more likely to commit suicide. 10% of all female veterinarians from 2000 to 2015 are documented to have, from their deaths have documented to be suicide related. And then this um, survey in 2014 is interesting. Almost 10% of veterinarians have current severe psychological distress. Okay, that, that is an uh, incredible number. Um, and 31% have experienced de um, depressive episodes and 17% have thought about suicide. So it's tricky because we're, veterinarians are predisposed to this, okay? We're, we're, we're empathetic, hopefully, um, and we care about animals. We want to make, or want to appease, um, and then there's a lot of pressures of the field. But some of that, there's a lot of it in the U.S. The U.S. system is really screwed up, honestly. But it, with, you take away a lot of the financial pressures that are in a lot of the other areas of the world, it's better. I hesitate to even talk about this, but I was wondering if I could put it at the very end, because I know I'm gonna get that question, right? That's what the question. I get this every single day from people writing me, what, but what about, I'm like, man? Okay, so, do I have time to address this? Okay, so, okay, okay. So I'll try to get this quickly. And this is just my views. I actually, my views are probably different than a lot of other vegans' views on this, and a lot of, um, definitely a lot of other vets. Um, but I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm not a nutritionist, and I need to put that out there. I'm not going to speak as an expert on nutrition, and, I, and that's very important to know. Um, my friend, Sarah Dodd, wrote this, uh, a couple of recent good papers out here that, that talk about the potential for this. Is there a demand for it? And there appears to be a growing demand for vegan diets. So about 1.6 of Guardian's feed and this, this was a survey that went out to, quote unquote, pet owners. 1.6% of guardians fed their, their animals plant-based diets. Okay, that's still really low. Around 40% of the people that were surveyed, this is all people, not just vegans, just pe pet owners, um, that they're concerned about welfare of the animals that went in their food. 
I'm, I was amazed. That's even a high number. I'm, I'm glad that people are even thinking about that. But about three quarters of these people surveyed um, say that they're concerned about nutritional completeness is the reason why they're not doing it. Okay, so this graph here just shows that among vegans, on the, on the far side, about 80% would consider giving their dogs vegan food. Okay, and the, as you go to vegetarian, it's less than 50%, pescatarian, less than 50%, and omnivores, you're even around 20%. Right, it's actually pretty similar numbers for cats, similar pattern here. This is just would consider doing it. They're open to the idea. That's important, right, to be open to the idea. And so I can't really get, I know you wanted to say, can I put my dog on a vegan diet? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go out on a limb and do that. I'm not gonna answer that question. Okay, that there is some growing research out there. Okay, I think it's really important to accumulate the, the research. But here's a couple comments from, again, my colleague, Sarah. Dogs have dietary requirements for energy and essential nutrients, but they do not have a recognized requirement for animal-derived ingredients, per se. It doesn't mean they have to come from animals. Right? They need nutrients, not animals. Okay, there's things we have to look for. Okay, there's nutrients that they really need, DHA, taurine, methionine, vitamin A, B12, D. So we gotta make sure they have all those and we gotta make sure we can find animal, um, not sources that are not animal based. So here's my take. Take it for what it's worth. I get a lot of flack for this, honestly, sometimes. So nutrients matter, not the source. Right? I like to focus on whether this is theoretically possible. Can this be done? Okay. And if we can do it, we should try to do it. Right? We, we, can, we put people on the moon, right? Can we figure out what meat is made out of? Can we find out the nutrients that are in there? And can we make them bioavailable for other animals? And can we make that in packages and sell it? Does that sound impossible? Right? And I think that a lot of times people say, you know, vegan diets are, no, it's impossible, my dogs aren't vegan, my cats aren't vegan. Well, that's not the argument. I don't want to have that right now. I want you to have that theoretical possibility. Is this a problem that we can solve? It seems highly solvable, doesn't it? Right? But when we use terms like cats are carnivores, dogs are carnivores, that ends the argument right there. Right? People say, oh, I'm vegan, but I'm not going to feed my dog vegan because their name is carnivore. Right? Well, you just made a word end all conversation. Right? And, that, and that's not a very f fruitful way to talk. And the word carnivore, that's a phylogenetic. It's an evolutionary term. It, it just means that it's related to this group, right? Pandas are carnivores, okay? They're eating bamboo. So they, I would not hold too much connection between the word carnivore and that they need to eat animals. I think we can solve this. I'm not saying we have nutritionally complete, perfect diets today, but I think this is something that we should be pursuing, okay? And not just say, no, animals are allowed, you know, they're carnivores and they can eat, whatever. Okay, so is this something you should consider? Yeah, you should consider it, but then at the end of the day, yes, you should. Um, <laughs> it provides some authority um, in the things you say, and it opens a lot of doors, right? I, the things I can do compared to when I was a non-veterinarian as, as an animal advocate, I, I can do all that stuff and a lot more. Okay, and I've just very recently finished my specialization, so now I can do a lot of things, and uh, uh, um, I'm really looking forward to the future. 